Hello, I'm Dan Quigley on 7HQ from Flex Radio Systems. I'm here at the 2021 QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. And the topic of this presentation is the local area network in today's ham shack. During the presentation, I'll be discussing the essential nature of the local area network, some common network topologies for Flex Radio products, Flex Radio bandwidth requirements, SmartLink, our free remote access solution, and I'll be providing some tips and bits taken from the interactions our support team has with radio operators. Finally, if you're attending the expo, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for any questions. Now, amateur radio is a long tradition of making significant contributions to science, engineering, and industry, and networks are no exception. The original purpose of the ARRL, as its name implies, was to form a network of amateurs who could relay messages across the country by repeating it from one station to another. For nearly four decades now, the radio amateur has been adopting and innovating with digital networks. In fact, so many innovations have occurred that in today's ham shack, the LAN is as essential to operating as a feed line. Here are a few examples why. A network provides nearly instant access to vast libraries of documentation, product manuals, and other information. You can more easily share data and collaborate on specific areas of interest, expanding the reach of those groups globally. Access to specialized parts, equipment, firmware, software, and support for all of the above. Online services that support amateur radio are now commonplace with new ones like a virtual ham expo and an online license exam. We can use cost-effective services today to design, test, and build custom circuits, lay out our PCBs, and even the mechanical components, then have them professionally manufactured in quantities of one shipped and delivered to our doorsteps with just a few days of time. Real enough time services that enhance the practice of the radio art, like solar weather, DX predictions, locating satellites, logging, contesting, and award tracking. Real time services like APRS, time synchronization for meteor scatter and new digital modes, webcams, and even an internet VoIP telephone service just for hands. So armed just with a web browser or a cell phone, you can operate your own station or a big gun contest station or both at the same time from just about any corner of the world. Two, ex two outstanding examples of remote access technology is our SmartLink solution and the remote ham radio service. This list is by no means complete. Innovations occur quickly and at scale, and there's really no sign of it slowing down at all. But to take advantage of any of these innovations, you need a local area network. And according to the latest statistics, you probably already have one. So let's take a look at a handful of local area network topologies through the lens of Flex Radio products and discuss some benefits and drawbacks of them. The most basic LAN is a single Ethernet cable. Simply plug a PC or Mac on one end and a radio on the other. We call this topology the field day setup at Flex Radio. While this topology is trivial to implement and provides great security, it does have a few other disadvantages, like longer boot times, because both PCs and network radio clients expect to be connected to a LAN with more services. It can be logically more complicated to configure devices on a network like this in some cases. And upgrades could be more difficult for you. Unless the PC or Mac has two network cards, you can't take advantage of online services. There's no easy way to add a second radio or a PC to this network or any other network type of device. Because of these disadvantages, we don't recommend this topology for most of our customers' use cases. And we can improve on it by adding a low-cost network switch that eliminates several of the disadvantages. 
Flex M models employ this very topology when operating standalone. There is no Ethernet cable. We provide that connection for you inside the radio because in the radio is a switch with a cable connected to the front panel and the other end is connected to the radio. Adding a switch implements a good minimal network topology that can support more than two network devices like an M model panel, a PGXL, or another complete operating station. Many of the same disadvantages apply to this topology and depending on the network device that you add, you might be required to configure it with an IP address or other information. Because of these drawbacks, we don't recommend this topology for the ham shack. By adding a commonly available edge router to the topology, we can eliminate a few more disadvantages. A router is a device that keeps logical networks separated and usually comes with a set of services that network devices are designed to expect of the LAN they're connected to. One of these services is Dynamic Host Control Protocol Service or DHCP service. DHCP is the protocol used by both clients and a DHCP service to request and then supply information necessary for devices to join and participate on a network. A unique IP address is at the top of that list, but DHCP provides other pieces of information useful to network devices. The DHCP service makes it possible for your laptop or cell phone or any device to easily connect to and communicate on either Wi-Fi or wired networks, all without the complication of tracking or configuring IP addresses. It is the basis of network plug and play and usually simplifies adding or removing network devices. Just plug them in and turn them on. Note, while this topology solves pretty meaty problems, we don't recommend it to our customers because it still has a big disadvantage, namely no internet connection. The solution to that is adding another device that bridges data between your LAN and the internet. It can be a modem, or more commonly, it's a device that it conveniently combines a modem, router, and usually a network switch. By connecting to the internet, all of the downsides are reduced and it is the most commonly deployed consumer network topology worldwide. And it's what we recommend. We also recommend using wired connections to connect our transceivers whenever possible. Wired ethernet is more reliable and usually is not a shared resource like the Wi-Fi spectrum. It offers higher bandwidth and higher performance. However, running Ethernet cable around your home can be difficult, costly, and sometimes just impossible. To work around physical constraints like that, using a wireless network bridge can be used. This type of bridge can use a number of wireless technologies. Wi-Fi is by far the most common, but there are solutions that use proprietary protocols and spectrum. Some use cable TV wiring or even common AC wiring. Bridges can sometimes be complex or confusing to configure properly, and that can create problems for you. And even some of the problems can prevent peer-to-peer -peer services like those used by Flex Radio products. Our help desk staff has a considerable amount of experience with bridging products and networks in general. So before you buy one, please reach out to our help desk by creating a ticket and ask for advice and assistance. Despite our rich technical history, far too frequently I hear Ham say that they don't understand computer networks. In my opinion, there is really no excuse for an amateur radio operator in today's world to lack a basic understanding of networks. Most all family room entertainment equipment sold today is designed for use on a typical consumer network and most consumers who have nowhere near the knowledge of electronics that dams routinely demonstrate can figure out how to use it. So the fact is networks are no more difficult to learn than reading a schematic or understanding the fundamentals behind tuning an antenna. One operator told me that he would love to learn about networks, but the trouble is I need to deploy one to learn about it. Well, there is this 
document you can read. But for those of you who are dread learning about networks, just get online. There's some great free online training resources available, and all of them allow you to learn at your own pace. Drop me an email if you like a copy of a list I keep, and I'll put my contact info up at the end of the presentation so you can ask for it. One of the most common questions we get from customers is a question about how much network bandwidth is required for our transceivers. So here is the list of current functional bandwidth requirements for the various streams used by Flex Radio System transceivers. First up, our products are engineered for solid performance on consumer grade networks, so you don't need anything special. Next is that the data rates listed here are ideal, meaning they don't account for network layer protocol overhead and are per slice or pan adapter. So you're likely to see more. The Flex API control protocol is used for command communication between a radio and a client. The bandwidth requirements for this protocol are minimal and hardly worth mentioning. Next up are the Vita 49 meter streams. Now these are the data streams that various meters use to display their information. Depending on what the operator is doing at the time, they can consume between 10 kilobits and 20 kilobits per second of network bandwidth. The audio stream from the radio to a client is compressed and it uses about 70 kilobits per second. On the other hand, the microphone stream from the client to the radio are 425 kilobits per second uncompressed. As are each DAC stream that is in use, 425 kilobits per second uncompressed. So those of you who own a 6700 run eight simultaneous FTC, FT8 sessions on separate pan adapters. Consider that you're consuming about eight megabits per second just for the DAC streams. And remember, it's not just network resources that you're consuming. Your PC CPU has work to do as well. The CAT system is unique and uses a combined 110 kilobits per second of bandwidth. So those of you who are familiar with CAT are probably scratching your head right now and asking, how can a protocol with discrete commands of just a few characters long use that much bandwidth? Well, not all CAT commands are processed by the radio. The CAT subsystem tracks changes in radio states that it can occur very quickly using a different mechanism, like the frequency changes of a slice receiver or PTT. We do this to ensure that each CAT command from every CAT connection is handled locally whenever and as quickly as possible. Another benefit is each piece of software that uses CAT doesn't require a separate connection to the radio and therefore a round trip to process the commands. In this way, when a CAT command is processed, it can happen very quickly. It keeps resources on the radio in check and it doesn't slow down the software application using it. Each IRQ sample is 32 bits wide, making a single IQ sample 64 bits wide. And the highest supported rate on our radios currently is 192 kilosamples per second. So doing the math, you end up with an ideal bandwidth of about 12.2 or three megabits per second for one IQ stream. Factoring in overhead, an IQ stream can be a bit more costly. Now, there's some really great software out there that utilizes IQ streams. So if you're running on a slow or low bandwidth link, make sure the bandwidth is there to support it. Each pan adapter on a flex radio client has two components that consume bandwidth. First is the spectrum display, which uses about 60 kilobits per second. The waterfall, which uses between 60 kilobits per second and one megabits per second, depends on the frame rate that is set. This is why we recommend lowering frame rate of the waterfall on your pan adapters when connecting over lower bandwidth links. So now that we've listed the various protocols and functions that consume bandwidth in a flex radio product, I think some rules of thumb are in order here. A single pan adapter with one slice receiver running CW or single sideband running a local microphone or CW paddle will consume between 200 kilobits per second and 1.15 megabits 
uh, per second, depending on the waterfall frame rate. A single pan adapter running FT8 will consume between 725 kilobits per second and 1.7 megabits per second, plus an additional 435 kilobits per second while transmitting if it's on another slice. The other rule of thumb is don't turn on an IQ sample stream unless you really need one. However, all of this said, these requirements are really a drop in the bucket for most consumer lands. So if you can stream a 180p movie from Netflix, your network bandwidth is adequate. Remember that because our products make use of peer-to-peer -peer connections on your LAN, that reality doesn't change when using our free remote access solution, SmartLink. At its heart, SmartLink is a secure access directory service that works by maintaining a directory of your radios and the minimum amount of information that clients need to remotely connect to them. Once every few minutes, each SmartLink-enabled transceiver phones home over an encrypted link to our cloud-based SmartLink directory service and updates a database with your current public internet IP address and the two communications ports required for peer-to-peer -peer communication between a client and the radio. The values for these communication ports are configured when you first register a radio for SmartLink and when you also set up the port forwarding for your router. All SmartLink connections use the latest transport layer security protocol, which requires a certificate to even establish a connection. Then once established, all the data along the link is encrypted. For a client to query SmartLink for a connection set, it must first authenticate with the service using OAuth, the internet standard for secure logins. OAuth also uses TLS. When a client wants to connect with a transceiver using SmartLink, the client uses the same TLS protocol and encryption to authenticate with our SmartLink service and re request the public internet IP address and the two communications ports for the specified transceiver. The client then uses TLS security to open two connections through the two port forwarding rules on your edge router and when successful, Operation continues exactly like the radio and client share the same local private network, except both connections are remote and are using encrypted data. SmartLink supports as many radios as you can register. In fact, each radio can be at a different physical location. There are plenty of private groups that use SmartLink to share access to their stations. There are some specific instructions when more than one radio that uses SmartLink is on the same network. The base requirement is that each radio must have a unique pair of port forwarding rules established on the edge router. There's a white paper available on this topic and please submit a help desk ticket if you need assistance or additional information about it. Flex Radio has worked to make SmartLink easy to configure for a single radio. Our radio firmware has an ability to automatically configure the firewall rules if your router supports universal plug and play. UPnP is a service commonly used by many consumer products, and in most cases, SmartLink can be co configured and tested with just a few clicks of the mouse. Of course, we also allow you to have complete control over your router and provide a way to set up and test manual port forwarding rules if you wish to use them. Because SmartLink uses the internet, network throughput between the client and the radio is important. So here's a list of common connection types and their suitability for use with SmartLink. Dial-up and Clark Orbit satellites, for very different reasons, are off the list. DSL usually does have sufficient bandwidth. However, in most cases, you will need to dial back the bandwidth requirements for the session. We've had reports that Starlink, the new low orbit satellite service, that are promising, but the jury is still out on that, so watch this space. If you're using LTE, 5G, cable, or fiber for your internet, systems are all go. But remember, one end of the, of the network pipe may be good, but what happens between it and the other end is important too. The best guidance we have for SmartLink is 
Any internet connection type faster than DSL is usable. Avoid double NATs, and we'll have more on that later. Manage your bandwidth consumptions on slow links. Reduce the waterfall frame rate. Limit the number of pan adapters you use, and think twice about using IQ streams. This next section provides answers to some of the more frequent questions the support team receives at Flex Radio Systems. This is one of our favorites. Installing a gigabit of fiber does not guarantee you have the throughput required when connecting to a remote station. It's a common fallacy. And as the graphic suggests, the path data takes from a source to a destination can pass through a lot of equipment and networks. Let's review some common performance metrics. Bandwidth is a theoretical measure of how much data could be transferred from a source to a destination. This measure is what most ISPs sell and charge for. Packet loss occurs when one or more packets of data traveling across the network fail to reach their destination. Packet loss is usually caused by errors in data transmission, typically across wireless networks or network congestion on other types. Throughput is an actual measure of how much data is successfully transferred from one place to another. Latency is the time required for data to get from one place to another. And a cousin to latency, jitter can occur when data streams traverse a network that have to share network capacity with other data. There are more types of jitter, but that one is one of the most common. Most customers are concerned really with only one thing, the ability for a network to perform in a way that meets their needs. And the best advice we have to solve network performance issues, if you have them, is to measure it. And all of the metrics on this slide are a great place to start. So what is inside a consumer combo edge device? Well, we don't get this as an actual question, but when customers have problems with their network, the edge device is one place we take a good hard look at. Most consumers are unaware of the number and complexity of the services embedded inside these devices. In many ways, consumer edge devices provide the same services of the IT department. Many of the services are interdependent and misconfiguring them can impact performance. So at the very least, they create a multitude of configuration complexity. Thankfully, or not, the manufacturers of the devices or the ISPs that deploy them will configure the services to meet the needs of an average consumer home out of the box. Since most hams are not average consumers, this impedance mismatch can create friction and support phone calls. Additionally, Devices provided by the ISPs are often locked down so consumers can't fiddle with them. So support calls may need to start with your ISP. There's a new trend forming where manufacturers who sell direct to consumers are combining edge devices like these with cloud services. And this is so they can sell value-added online services and other products and support. The services I've seen are very consumer oriented. And though I would probably buy one for my mother's home, I'm not gonna use one of these in my shack. Now we're not suggesting that you run out and invest in discrete edge network components, then learn about how to configure each one of them. But we want you to be aware that if you need something that doesn't fit the consumer mold, you may not be able to get there using devices like these. Again, our support team can provide advice that can help you make some of these trade-offs. So be sure to drop us a note in a help desk ticket. Mesh networking is a relatively new entry into the consumer market. So you would be forgiven to think it would automatically be better than a standard router. But there are some advantages to use mesh. There's better coverage, especially in larger homes, and mesh networks are generally more resistant to interference. It is easier to add range and some manufacturers provide satellites that allow you to add wired devices without running cable. 
And as we've talked about before, that can be an important consideration for some hams. Mesh can support more wireless devices and is generally easier to set up guest Wi-Fi access. Wireless devices will have more consistently available bandwidth, especially in larger homes where residents or guests are spread out. Now, some disadvantages are the industry has not yet settled on a signaling standard for mesh. Now, 802.11s is close, so you need to check for compatibility if you mix product brands in your future mesh network. Mesh adds additional technical complexity to your network. Most of it is transparent to you, but there is still more that can go wrong. And many mesh setups have higher local network latency, which will degrade performance. And that is a consideration if you're using a mesh to wired network satellite. The backbone of mesh used by the satellites is usually dependent on wireless although some products allow you to make that a wired connection. Uh, and it is generally more expensive than standard products and mesh will consume more RF bandwidth. It won't improve the reliability of the network connection provided by the edge device. And you still have that single point of failure now only with a mesh enabled device. Mesh alone is not better for amateur radio. And the bottom line is you need to decide whether or not the outlay for a full mesh network is worth it. In larger homes with dead spots, mesh networking can provide a way to immediately improve signal strength and coverage, or to provide wired ethernet to difficult locations. It is usually expensive in money and time to overhaul your existing network and going for full mesh may simply be described as overkill unless you consistently have multiple users and devices competing for bandwidth. Now there are some mesh network systems out there such as Google Wi-Fi, Nest Wi-Fi, and Eero which are rel relatively cheap to set up as long as you don't need too many satellites. Is ISP provided network gear okay? We touched on this question a bit earlier. Again, to help illustrate the topic, we'll use an advantages disadvantages list. And if you're thinking about making a network change, we suggest you do the same. Some advantages to ISP equipment is that it can be cash flow affordable, especially if the equipment is leased. Over the long term, though, I found purchasing equipment a much better investment. ISP provides support when it breaks, and most ISPs are good at rolling a truck to troubleshoot and fix the problem. And if the problem is with the equipment that they leased you, that service is usually free. ISP devices are typically plug and play because they're designed for the average consumer and more or less for hams without specialized network requirements. Because most ISP provided equipment will support UPnP by virtue of the need for that service in consumer gear, SmartLink works usually. Now here are the cons. The edge device is typically locked down by the ISP, so setting up reserved IP addresses, port forwarding, etc. can require calling the ISP. Some ISPs share device bandwidth with publicly available Wi-Fi services. Now, this doesn't impact the security of your network, but it does use spectrum and it may impact the performance of your internet connection depending on where you live. These devices are generally not optimized for amateur radio and ISC, ISP support is not optimized for amateur radio either. Uh, there is some friction because ISPs do not support all connected equipment. For example, something as simple as a printer if it can't connect, but your cell phone can, you may not be able to count on ISP support. And then finally, ISPs generally provide lower performance hardware versus what you can purchase independently. Oh, the dreaded double NAT. NAT is the standard abbreviation for network address translation. And as the name implies, it 
translates addresses from one network to another, which is very similar to what port forwarding does. So similar, in fact, that in some circles, people use the abbreviation PAT, port address translation, instead of port forwarding. So what is a double NAT? Double NATs occur when two or more routers on a network are performing network address translation. It generally does not affect computer use or web browsing, but it can cause issues with peer-to-peer -peer services like SmartLink. Problems arise mainly because the NAT tables on one device lose track of a particular connection, and this can break services that use UPnP. And they probably won't work unless someone can go in and reforward those services manually. In consumer homes, this is most commonly caused by installing a Wi-Fi router as a WAP, wireless access point, behind an existing edge router. It is usually easily cured by placing the Wi-Fi router into bridge mode if that mode is supported. Double NAT can also occur on some ISP networks where they provide customers centralized gateway services. Most of these ISPs will work with you to correctly forward the necessary ports from the gateway that they control. Let's take a few moments on some general network related tips. First up, don't forget the chokes. Trust me, Ethernet and RF do not mix well. The single most repeated help desk question is network problems during transmit. Installing chokes on your network equipment will pay dividends, especially when QRO. We recommend using MIX31 ferrites for the shack LAN. MIX31 provides excellent common mode suppression from 1 to 10 MHz and then performs about the same as MIX43 up to 250 MHz. Invest in an uninterruptible power supply or UPS. This is especially useful for the network gear in your home or shack. A flex radio transceiver can benefit from one too. To connect to flex radio products, the client and the network must be on the same subnet unless you're using SmartLink. Now, normally this is not a problem, but when a client and a transceiver are not, the client can see the transceiver but not connect to it. The reason is the discovery packets sent by flex radio transceivers utilize the global broadcast IP address, which means that it can be received by all network interfaces on a physical network. So no matter which network subnet they're configured to use, the discovery packets can be received by clients or any other software and hardware that listens for them. Remember that tooltips are your friend. Hovering your mouse over the listed transceiver in the Smart SDR radio picker dialog will easily confirm an IP address and internet availability. It is super handy for troubleshooting. Another question arises when people compare the results of a ping test and the RTT metric provided in the Smart SDR or Maestro network diagnostics page. Comparing these two values is really like comparing apples and oranges. Ping is a generic utility that uses the Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP. This protocol is encapsulated in the IP header of a network frame, which means the ping measurement is really being taken at the network layer in the OSI model. The RTT measurement occurs much higher in the stack at the application layer and includes several layers of processing overhead that ping does not. The RTT metric is influenced more by peak load conditions that can occur between the client and the radio. For example, there can be bursts of higher RTT when clients first start up. It's always a good idea to reset the diagnostic statistics prior to using it as a diagnostic measure. You may notice a security dialog asking for permissions on behalf of some newly installed app on your PC to connect to the network. This dialog is generated by built-in Windows security and is asking for a permission to configure a specific fire rule, firewall rule that restricts an application to use a specific network port 
to communicate with the outside world. Smart SDR and Flex Radio Utilities are no different in that regard, and they ask for similar permissions when they are first run. Trouble can ensue, though, when Windows Update sometimes resets the network type, which can load in different Windows firewall profiles. Perhaps one that doesn't have the correct rules enabled. And you lose connectivity to the outside world. The fix is easy. Just select the PC to use the correct profile in the Windows Network Settings dialog. And on you go. Well, that is all I have today for the formal portion of the presentation. As promised, here is my contact information. The presentation deck has some additional tables and information in some of the reference slides, so I encourage you to download it. Those references can be handy, and I hope you find them useful. For now, though, I've put up a flex-centric OSI model table, so this question slide can be a whole lot more interesting than the garden variety. 73 for now.